and after the torturous run up the Rotang Pass, we've narrowed the field down to three cars, three standout cars in this group, the Fabia, the Ritz and this, the Honda Jazz. Now you will agree when I say that diesel engines make a lot of sense. They're powerful, they're refined and crucially, you save a lot of money when you tank it up at the pumps. But then you have to experience the charms of a sweet petrol engine like this 1.2 litre IV tech engine in the Jazz. This thing at idle is silent, it is so silent that you don't know if the engine is running, unlike the diesels which are a bit clattery. And whereas diesels peak at 4500 rpm, this thing goes all the way up to 6500 rpm. And when you rev it to 6500, mm, it kindles the fires of youth in you. While I was being horribly nerdy, analyzing revs, power bands and clutch bite points, Shumi was doing what only Shumi can do finger plastics and rattle on about colours. And now it's all black. Yes, I am going to do this the whole episode. But the point is, black means we're in the Skoda Fabia. Don't get worried, you do get colour options and you can have other interior schemes if you want. But the point is, what Skoda has managed to do is use high quality materials, cleverly chosen, carefully placed, to create a very black cabin which actually feels high quality, which feels like something you might want to actually be in. And the thing is, being a Fabia, being a premium hatch, all the equipment is there. You've got air conditioning controls right up where you'd usually use them. There's a very good sounding music system, although it does take a little bit of time to figure out just how to get the aux working and that kind of thing. No such problems with the Suzuki's diesel. Bertie was mighty happy. As far as diesel hatches go, the Ritz's diesel engine is by far the best derivative of the 1.3 GTD that Fiat makes. It's smooth, it's refined, it's aggressive when you need it and there's a lot of low down torque as well. However, I have noticed on this part of Rotang, that is on the Ladakh side, the turbo started kicking in at about 2200 rpm. So there is a bit of delay, a little bit of turbo lag. Not that it really bothers driving this car too much, because you just have to slot it into first, get it back into the power band and off you go. We were climbing higher and higher. The altitude was making our heads light and tizzy and the cars breathless. The terrain too becomes ever more difficult with hard stopping river crossings but towards the end that's where the BRO have finished sections of the road and it is truly fabulous. Like a tarmac rally stage out of Rally Monte Carlo, perfect to get the jazz working. The Jazz, like most Japanese cars, feels light and fragile, but in reality, she's pretty strong. I'm surprised with the way she's handling these rough roads. There are no squeaks, no rattles, and the suspension is not feeling like it's going to come apart. In fact, it feels tougher than the other cars in this test, cars which are allegedly better built for India, more suited to Indian conditions. While I couldn't stop singing praises of the Jazz, Bird was getting a bit nitpicky with the Ritz. The Ritz gearbox has received a lot of praise, but to me, I think the gear shift is a bit notchy and I don't like these extremely short throws. With a little bit of spirited driving, if I push this car really hard, I just have this feeling that the gearbox may just boop, pop out in my hand. Having given up on ambitious plans to go to Sokar Lake, we grab a quick cup of tea at the base of Baralacha and do a quick car swap and begin the ascent to Baralacha. At the start of this drive, I expected the i20 to do rather well. If not winning, I honestly expected it to be at least amongst the top three. Well, surprise, surprise, it's not amongst the top three. What's even more of a surprise is how well the Ritz is coping with all the bashing. Now we know from our past Rady Himalaya experience that Marutis are built quite tough. But the way the Ritz is going through all this is quite impressive. There's not a single squeak nor rattle. The engine is the least affected by the altitude and lack of oxygen and it's a nice car to drive. It's so nice in fact that everybody is clamouring to drive this car. It's also very refined and silent but that's quite the opposite of what you would say about the Fabia. The engine is a bit noisy and clattery and it sounds like a tractor coming out of the woods. But that is why this cabin has been built to perfection. It isolates all noises from outside. And once you roll the windows, silence. The extreme altitude and lack of oxygen was now beginning to tell. On the cars, but more so on the drivers 
who had become extremely crotchety and irritable. Altitude sickness is a terrible thing to experience and once it hits you, it hits you. There's nothing you can do to mitigate its effects other than running to lower lying regions post haste. The camera crew were under huge pressure here to call it a wrap. And so we end the show at the Baralaja Pass. At 16,500 feet, it's the third highest pass in the country, but it also has the unenviable reputation of being the most treacherous and the most deadly pass in the country. We started the day with the top three cars in this test, the Fabia, the Jazz and the Ritz. And we finally have a winner. And it is the Ritz. In a perfect world, with money being no object, we would all take the Jazz. But the Ritz, it does almost everything that the Jazz does and at a far cheaper price. The fact of the matter is, there are no losers in this test. All nine cars came up here and all nine cars will be driven all the way back to Delhi. But now, before the altitude gets to us, we are heading back to Jispa to get some well-deserved rest. Thanks for watching. Read more about this spectacular drive and how the cars performed in the bumper 11th anniversary issue of Overdrive magazine, coming soon to a new stand near you.